Okay, good afternoon, members of the audience and special guests. Before we begin the proceedings, and on behalf of all those present, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I would also like to pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. This session will now be recorded. We will record audio, screen share and our presenters. We will not be recording any video input or audio from yourself. Welcome to all UTS students, staff and all friends of ACRI and UTS. My name is Thomas and I'm a project and research officer at the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney. UTS ACRI is an independent, non-partisan research institute established in 2014 by the University of Technology, Sydney. Chinese study centres exist in other Australian universities. UTS ACRI, however, is Australia's first and only research institute devoted to studying the relationship of these countries. UTS ACRI seeks to inform Australia's engagement with China through research, analysis and dialogue grounded in scholarly rigour. If you wanted to explore more about the Australia-China relationship, more details are available on our website at australiachinarelations.org. Today, we are here to discuss national security reporting in Australia's discussion of the PRC. UTS ACRI Director Professor James Lawrenson will moderate this panel discussion with Professor Monica Attard and Mr. Anthony Galloway. Audience questions are welcome at the end, so please remember to submit your questions using the, using the Q and A tab along the bottom panel of this Zoom webinar. Now, a little bit about the speakers. Professor James Lawrenson's academic research has been published in leading scholarly journals, including China Economic Review and China Economic Journal. He also provides regular commentary on contemporary developments in China's economy and the Australia-China economic relationship in such publications as the Australian Financial Review, The Australian, The Sydney Morning Herald, and South China Morning Post, amongst many others. Professor Monica Attard is the Head of Journalism and Co-Director at the Centre for Media Transition at the University of Technology, Sydney. Professor Attard holds a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Law, and Order of Australia for Services to Journalism. As a journalist for 35 years, she has been a reporter for Four Corners, Late Line, and the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. During her time as the ABC's Russian correspondent, she reported on major historical events, such as the coup against Mikhail Gorbachev, the collapse of Soviet communism, and the rise of Boris Yeltsin. Thank you for joining us here today, Professor Attard. Mr. Anthony Galloway, holds a Bachelor of Journalism from Monash University and is currently the Foreign Affairs and National Security Correspondent for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, based in the Press Gallery in Parliament House. He previously covered federal and state politics for the Herald Sun, and we are very glad to have him here with us today. Welcome, Mr. Galloway. I will now hand it over to Professor James Lawrenson to begin the discussion. Thanks very much, Tom and Monica and Anthony. Just a big thank you from me for being with us today. It's a, a topic that's of importance, but it's one I know a limited amount about. So it's great to have such um, people with your professional qualifications to be able to shed some light on these issues. Look, I thought I might start off today uh, by providing some background on what motivated UTS ACRI to hold this event. Look, the short story is, is that over the last five years, national security has become an increasingly prominent frame um, in media reporting on China and relations with China. Now, there's nothing particularly unexpected or problematic in that observation. Um, within China's own borders, the Chinese government itself has placed greater emphasis on national security. Um, and it would be impossible for Australian media to somehow avoid that, um, particularly when there are actually Australian citizens and residents caught up in those moves. I mean, I think in particular, of Australian citizens and residents um, detained in what the Chinese government calls retraining facilities in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. And also we have two Australians, um, Yang Heng Jun and Cheng Lei, uh, detained in China facing national security charges. So these are 
plainly relevant issues um, to Australian media commentary on China. And further than that, um, we also have issues within Australia's own borders. I think in May 2017 of then ASIO head Duncan Lewis stating that the level of foreign interference in Australia was at unprecedented levels. Now, during his tenure, he resisted assigning a particular country to where that foreign interference was coming from. But after he retired, he clarified and said, quote unquote, it was overwhelmingly from China. So the facts on the ground in China and official assessments such as those coming from Duncan Lewis um, explain part of the reason why, or much of the reason why national, the national security frame has become more prominent. But aside from those, what we also see, aside from those instances where you have an authoritative figure such as Duncan Lewis going on the record, what we often see are media reports alluding to security threats from China that cite anonymous sources. And that's a topic we're here to talk about today. Um, I recall way back to the second half of 2016, which is when I traced the latest decline in Australia-China relations too, uh, there was a piece in the Australian Financial Review by Aaron Patrick. Um, he was talking about then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, and this is what he said. Let me quote it. The government's top intelligence experts are concerned Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull isn't taking their warnings about the security threat posed by China seriously enough. And close quote. And to support this claim, Patrick cited, quote, three sources with senior contacts in the security services. Interesting, not the direct source contacts themselves, but contacts sources with senior contacts in the security services. And in fact, just today in the Australian, in um, this morning's Australian, there's a report uh, with the lead, Indo-Pacific nations are under pressure to give Chinese firms favourable access to infrastructure and economic opportunities in return for the supply of Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccines. The evidentiary base is according to sources. So this is precisely what I'm talking about today. And sometimes it can even appear to readers as though rival media outlets are trading blows with each other based on the quality of their each of their respective anonymous sources. On this point, I think back to a report in November 23, 2019, when you had Nick McKenzie from The Age breaking a story titled quote, defecting Chinese spy offers information trove to the Australian government. Uh, Mackenzie himself told Al Jazeera, quote, every indication we have is that the Australian government believes this man's story to be credible, intelligence he's sharing to be useful. It's no doubt going to be shared amongst the Five Eyes Intelligence Network, close quote. But less than a week later, you have the Australian's Paul Maley saying, citing multiple security sources, stating, quote, in the end, it took Australian security agencies less than a week to conclude self-proclaimed Chinese spy Wang Liqiang was not a highly trained intelligence operative dispatched by Beijing to wreak havoc on the nation's enemies and was at most a bit player on the fringes of the espionage community, close quote. So my point is not to take digs at any particular media outlet here, but it is to say that this is not easy terrain for readers and listeners to negotiate, particularly those like me who don't have a background in journalism or critical media studies. What I worry about is that the Republic response to these sorts of reports citing anonymous sources could go to one of two extremes. Um, on the one hand, you could have the Australian public regarding dubious reporting as authoritative on the China threat, um, and that could have some nasty spillovers in our community, including for Chinese Australians, who somehow, through no fault of their own, come to be associated with this China threat. On the other hand, the other extreme response that is also completely unhelpful for the national interest is that the public lose faith in media outlets, the fourth estate, and, that, and perhaps even security agencies as well. Now, successful liberal democracies don't just happen. Uh, they, are, they are supported by strong, robust institutions. So clearly that's not a positive response either. So look, with all that background today, let's get into the discussion. Um, Monica, I would like to go to you, first of all, for a question that's not actually about China or not actually about national security. But rather, I just want to get this clear. 
Just because a journalist cites an anonymous source, I mean, that's not a reason in itself to think that that reporting is dubious, right? I mean, or put it differently, sometimes journalists relying on anonymous sources can actually be performing an immense uh, public interest benefit. Have I got that right? Absolutely. Um, it often, anonymous sources often serve the public good and produce great public interest journalism. I mean, there are countless examples of that. Think back, you know, historically, Watergate, you know, Deep Throat, the FBI source who helped the Washington Post unravel the White House cover-up of, um, of uh, the, water the Watergate break-in. That was arguably one of the most consequential stories um, of, of the time. No one would argue that, that the breaking of that story wasn't in the public interest. I mean, I think it's important to remember that all news organisations would actually prefer for sources to go on the record. All news organisations have editorial policies around that, which differ, of course, in their stringency, but basically all err on the side of it being by far preferable preferable for sources to, to be on the record. And there's a reason for that because there's a massive trust issue and a credibility issue involved. The most important thing for a journalist and for a journalism organisation is credibility. If readers or viewers or listeners don't have faith that the stories that they're reading or watching or listening to are accurate, or if they suspect what the journalist is reporting from an anonymous source is manufactured, then the journalist's character is impugned and the work is impugned. So their, their work can be discredited quite easily, despite the fact that it may well be good fact that, it's, that they're using. So we know why on the record is preferable, um, but that's just not the way things work all the time. I mean, we've seen, for example, recently with the reporting of Donald Trump's White House, that it's not up for argument that reporting on what that president was doing and saying, the way he conducted himself in conversations with world leaders, the way he went about skewing policy impacted world affairs, not just, um, not just the United States. Yet for a source to go on the record was clearly problematic because they could be sacked or sued or humiliated. So we saw a major difference in the way American journalists reported Donald Trump's presidency with the use of more and more unnamed sources close to the president, which of course Trump slammed as fake um, and inaccurate, but to which news organisations retorted, well, no, you know, we are trustworthy, trust us. And they didn't have much to rely on, really, because it was in a, because the prob it, it created another problem because in a hyper-partisan atmosphere, or even in a situation where one nation player is seen as less, pal less you know, um, palatable than another, there'll always be people who don't want to trust journalism or journalists. As we saw with Trump and the atmosphere of distrust in journalism that he fostered, sometimes people just don't want the story to be true. And saying it's not true is easier for the consumer who's inclined to think like that. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's a really tricky, tricky area. Thanks, Monica. Can I have a, a follow-up question? Um, you mentioned that media outlets themselves are, are well aware of, of the risks um, of using anonymous sources. That is, their credibility could be called into question. Um, and I think most of our listeners, even economists like me who have no media background, can also appreciate the risk as well that a, that a powerful um, politician or bureaucrat or, or corporate spin doctor might share a piece of information and with a journalist, hoping that they'll run with it and that'll serve some end that they've got an investment in rather than the public interest. So can you talk a little bit about, and sort of brief our audience on what um, mechanisms media outlets have here um, to to check those potential risks um, from arising. For example, you're the head of journalism at UTS. Uh, are journalists, journalism students, do they do a compulsory ethics course? You've worked at the ABC for many years, um, editorial guidelines with, with strong oversight. So I, I'd be very keen to hear your, your, your briefing our audience on those sorts of issues. 
Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, all media organisations have their own codes around this issue of, of using anonymous sources and they have their own code of ethics. And of course, there's the MEAA code of ethics, which we uh, teach very strongly at UTS. Um, and whilst I can't speak directly to how serious the editorial oversight is in all media organisations, I imagine it is strong in most of them. It certainly is at the ABC, for example. Um, there would be, there would need to be a very, very, very strong strong public interest argument for an editor, for example, at the ABC to approve the use of one or more anonymous sources. And the threshold is generally very, very high. So it's not unusual to see Australian media organisations instructing journalists that if the only way to get or publish a story of significant public interest is to use anonymous sources, then they should be identifying the source as clearly as they can without going anywhere near identifying the person or even the group that the person belongs to. You can, you, you often see, um, um, you know, rules around that. The question I think comes down to whether, a, a, you know, a news organisation can make up an anonymous source. And the answer is obviously yes. But as before, nothing is more important to a serious news organisation than trust and credibility. And you need to ask why a news organisation would risk trust to use a fake source or a, um, you know, a not entirely legitimate source. And there's also, I think, to, it's important to remember that there's a lot of editing that goes on in any story important enough to use an anonymous source. There are multiple levels of editorial oversight. So it would have to be a very, very large cabal of journalists and editors who decide to dupe their audience. And, and that's impossible to think of as a real possibility, frankly. Um, in relation to students, um, it's really important for them to know that few ethical issues in journalism are more able to get them into an ethical swamp than the use of anonymous sources. And, and we spend a lot of time on ethics, both at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. It's about understanding a number of issues, I think, for students that every time um, a reporter goes out to report a story, they'll be confronted with a different and often challenging set of circumstances that they need to navigate and to require you know, different solutions. And often, if not always, require the application of ethical parameters. Um, that, that journalism is always or should always be about public interest and that judgments about what is in the public interest is made by them and by their editors, and that's a very serious undertaking, and that in making that judgment, they're weighing up the evidence, and if the evidence weighs in on the side of it, this being an important story in the public interest to report, but that the source or sources face unacceptable risk in being on the record, that that needs to be respected. But it shouldn't stop the story being reported because of sensitivities around anonymity and certainly shouldn't stop the story if the journalists are sure of the motives behind the source who is requesting anonymity. I mean, motive is a very, very big issue here. Thanks, Monica. So look, this is important, folks, that I think we get this clear in our head. It's simply not possible for a journalist to cite an anonymous source and just push it directly out into the public realm. Um, what, what you're telling us, Monica, is that there's actually you know, uh, editorial oversight, potentially multi layers of editorial oversight. So look, Anthony, I might go to you next. Um, you're a practicing journalist in the field today. Um, you would sometimes use anonymous sources. Um, I'm assuming Nine or before that Fairfax has their own code of conduct or, or co code of conduct or rules around these issues. Um, when you look at the media landscape today, are those um, editorial policies consistent across media outlets? And how does Australia compare with media outlets overseas? Uh, they're not consistent. Um, I, I would argue my organisation, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, the two newspapers I file for probably have the most stringent policies. You'll never see in our papers just references to sources, according to sources, we have we have to identify them as best we can. Some, sometimes we can't say the organisation they come from for reasons that it will identify them, um, which we don't want to do, but that's, it, that, you know, I face intense scrutiny from my editors in, in kind of using anonymous sources and I have to explain why I'm granting them anonymity. Um, 
Now, I, I draw a big distinction between, um, one of the big distinctions I draw is, is this source um, authorised to speak on the record? Now, in the, in the space that I deal with national security, often the answer is no. Um, if I'm dealing with any kind of security official, they're not authorised to speak on the record, especially about operational matters. So a lot of the times it is self-explanatory. Um, it's, it's always important um, to explain that to the reader, um, even if it's just saying, according to security sources that are not um, authorised to speak publicly. I draw a big distinction between that and say straight political journalism, where journalists will grant politicians, for example, anonymity. Now, politicians are authorised to speak on the record about pretty much anything in the political realm. So that has to face a lot more scrutiny. Um, you know, why are we granting a politician anonymity? Normally it's because, you know, they want to bag a colleague or something like that or, or get ahead in some way. So that when we're granting politicians anonymity, that, that undergoes even more scrutiny than say um, what I'm doing because it's, it's quite self-explanatory. Um, to go back, sorry, to go back to you, the question about um, which organisations have which policies in Australia. I mean, outside of the MEAA uh, guidelines, which we all adhere to, there's, um, it, it just differs way too much between company. Um, the other term that I really hate seeing, and it's throughout the Australian media, and it's not allowed at my organisation, is it is understood. It's meaningless. Um, it's absolutely meaningless. Half the time you could just state it as fact or half the time you've got to attribute it to a source and you see it throughout the Australian media. And I think if we could ban that term, that'd be great. Agree. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. And how do you just to follow, how do you think Australia ranks compared with other countries? I mean, are there particular countries out there that just everyone in your, in your peer of uh, practitioners acknowledges that they've really got a good system? Um, and where do we sit on the pecking order? Yeah, I'd be interested to hear Monica's views on this as well. But I mean, just my reading of um, media organisations in the United States, it seems like there's just that there is a bar there that's a lot higher than what we have in Australia, um, both with sourcing and attribution. Um, there just seems to be a minimum standard there that they have to identify as best they can where their sources are coming from. And also they have to attribute uh, information that's reported by an organisation first. You, you'll notice in, in the North American media, they will always reference back to the first organisation that reported it. That's important because if the story's wrong, um, you know, where we might be, when you follow a story, you know, you, you might stack it up independently, but you're stacking it up based on a, an original story. And I think it's really important to link back to that to that original organisation that actually wrote that story because that's the primary material you're relying on. Thanks, Anthony. And Monica, can I ask you for your input on that? I mean, what, what's your take on where Australia um, lies in the, the pecking order of editorial uh, policies around anonymous sourcing? Well, look, uh, I mean, I'll t I'm, 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 I'm tending to agree with, with Anthony. I mean, I don't think there is consensus here around what best practice looks like. There's broad consensus that anonymous sources, you know, should be used cautiously and scarcely. But what that looks like at the edges, what individual media organisations policies look like when it comes to deciding which stories that use anonymous sources cut through the public interest threshold, that differs. And a complicating factor there obviously is how a publication views a particular issue, whether it believes um, the public interest factors in reporting on a particular issue or subject is so high that it warrants the use of anonymous sources. You know, one might, whilst another might be less activated to report the same issue using anonymous sources. But generally speaking, um, you know, as Anthony's pointed out, I mean, I, I think the American model is a lot less forgiving of using anonymous sources than we are here in Australia. Though, as I said, I think there's been a little bit of a breakdown in that in, that, um, in the Trump era for the reasons that I outlined earlier. Um, but I also think that it's important to remember that, that, that policies are constantly being changed and updated because they fray at the edges. You know, one reporter or editor might push the envelope a little too far and something gets through that is worrisome or at worst wrong. So we see media organisations constantly revising their editorial policies and their policies particularly around using anonymous sources. And, and certainly 
um, for example, in the lead up to elections, it's really important for media organisations to look closely at those editorial policies, at their rules of engagement between reporters and sources. And Anthony's talked about that. I mean, in the political sphere, it's a lot less um, uh, easy to understand why you would grant anonymity, but you, you, they need to make sure that no one is being used because that is a common motivation of sources who don't want to be named. And of course, in Australia, there's the other issue of the kind of patchwork of legislation around who can speak and who can't. And um, until that's all sorted out and there's some kind of uniformity there, it's hard to see that we'll ever see any degree of uniformity here around the use of anonymous sources. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Monica. Um, Anthony, I'd like to go to you next, sort of starting to drill down a bit into the, the national security as it applies to China stuff. One, one thing I noticed in your job title is that you're the Sydney Morning Herald's um, national security correspondent. Now, that's interesting for me because other people at your paper regularly, uh, other journalists regularly report on issues that relate to national security too. And that's true for other media outlets as well. Can a reader take some extra comfort from a report by someone whose specialisation it is to write on national security issues? I mean, are, are there things, for example, that you might be aware of or particularly sensitive to that some colleagues who don't regularly wade into the space as you do, um, they might come a bit adrift? I think so. There's only kind of three or four of us in Australia that kind of, uh, you know, dedicated on the round of of national security. Um, and, and I'd say with those colleagues, I don't see a lot of uh, misconceptions or, or, um, or falsely interpret or misinterpretations of intelligence, intelligence documents. I think we get our terms right um, when referring to things. We don't over egg uh, things where when I see other journalists wade into the space, I regularly see it. It's, it's, a lot of the time it's a question of tone, um, but I do see a lot of exaggeration uh, of uh, intelligence um, where they don't quite understand um, the nature of the document, let's say. Am I able to push you for examples, Anthony? Is that, comfortable, is that something you'd be comfortable sharing? Sure, I mean, without kind of, um, bagging my colleagues in too much. I mean, I, there was reporting of, for example, um, the Shanghai database last year where it was alleged um, that DFAT uh, at the um, Beijing embassy had a um, CCP member and that somehow that was kind of compromising the, the security of information inside that embassy. Um, I, I thought that kind of reporting probably didn't take into account of the fact that um, there are a lot of CCP members in China um, that locally engaged staff of embassies aren't allowed to see certain information and certain documents for that reason. And that just being a CCP member in China um, doesn't necessarily mean you're a, you're a high ranking spy. Um, likewise, there was some reporting of a um, dossier that was alleged to have been created by Western intelligence agencies last year, which um, I then reported on and, and pointed out it was actually created by the US State Department. Um, and it was at a time that the Trump administration was leaning heavily on the American intelligence community to, uh, to kind of establish this theory that the, um, that the uh, uh, coronavirus leaked out of the Wuhan laboratory. Now we still, all these months on, we still don't know. It could have, it, 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 it could have come out of a wet market. We're, we're really none the wiser, but um, Western intelligence officials were, were deeply uncomfortable with the Americans pursuing this line. Um, this dossier that was referenced in the Australian media, um, uh, as far as I could see, was not an intelligence uh, document prepared by, for example, uh, Five Eyes intelligence um, agencies. It was very much produced out of the US State Department. All right, thanks, Anthony. Um, look, if I can stick with you for one more question, it sort of relates to the previous one. Sometimes when I read media uh, uh, reporting, um, 
you'll get particularly egregious examples of where anonymous sources are used and what is being attributed to them um, seemingly makes little sense. The, what, what, the two examples you just cited are ones that have crossed my radar as well. Uh, but look, the, here's another example. Um, in September 2020, there was an ABC report, um, and I'm not having a I'm not having a particular dig at the ABC. I'm just this is where it appeared that cited a Five Eyes intelligence officer named Aeneas. Aeneas was the Five Eyes intelligence officer's code name, who stated, "Quote: Western thought is based on causality. East Asian thinking is like a spider's web." where moving any individual point on the web moves everything else. With this starting point, mosaic collection, intelligence collection, and analysis is both logical and natural for the East Asian mind. Now, when I read that, I spat out my wheat picks because, I mean, that is, you know, Orientalism just on steroids. I don't see how any reader could take that seriously. And interestingly, this specific sentence was later removed from the report but Aeneas um, remains in the story, ostensibly as a credible source commenting on differing approaches taken by Chinese and Western intelligence agencies. So, Anthony, what I wanted to ask you, are there any tricks of the trade you use that you could share with our audience, share with me, share with our audience today, that will help them um, recognise when they're dealing with quality journalism um, versus lousy journalism that perhaps aren't so egregious as those last few examples that we've been through? Yeah, I mean, I use such sources to confirm information or um, or dispute it to, to, to essentially stack up what I already have. Uh, I do often see in the media, you know, intelligence sources or security sources kind of quoted like that and I, I do often think no oh, it doesn't it doesn't sound like the, the the type of high ranking intelligence officials that you know you do occasionally come across they just don't talk like that so i do often wonder where are these yeah, where are these people coming from i mean maybe they have better sources than me um and they're more uh forthcoming with their colorful quotes but i mean i in terms of tricks of the trade i very much use um uh, sources, if we want to call them, to to stack up what I already know. Um, I mean, you can get a colourful quote from anyone off the record. Um, I, I prefer, in terms of on the record quotes, I prefer, you know, going to someone who's named, could be an academic such as yourself, could be a former intelligence official that's happy to go on the record. I think that's a better way of quoting. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Monica, can I ask you the same question? Uh, you've, you know, you're the head of journalism now, but you've got a long journalism career. You would have um, been reading reports, citing anonymous sources for years, for decades. Um, what are the, what are the other tricks, any tricks of the trade that you use to to sort out the quality stuff from the lousy stuff? Oh, look, I think um, that 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 um, that pub test that Anthony just. Um, highlighted is a pretty good one. I mean, sometimes you can just, you just, it doesn't feel as though the terminology is wrong, the, the nuance is wrong, um, the emphasis is wrong, the terminology doesn't gel, um, and, and even outside of areas that you might know an awful lot about. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a really important one, but also that goes to the issue of, of newsrooms making sure that they have specialists like Anthony working in specialist rounds so that you don't have people, uh, you don't have journalists working in the areas where they're unfamiliar um, and, and perhaps falling into a trap of using anonymous sources that um, are taking them for, for a bit of a ride. You know, I mean, look, having said that, there, there are just so many examples of, of, of really great journalists Journalism that has been based on on an anonymity, um, and you, you, you know, you mentioned Mackenzie and Baker the Age earlier, but I think the way that they pursued that the note printing story for years um, was extraordinary, and and it was an important public interest story, and it did result in 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 people being prosecuted for um, for breaking the law. Um, you know, M Michael Harvey, Jared McManus, um, 
they also used anonymous sources to disclose that um, the Commonwealth had decided not to increase veterans' pensions. That's a, that is a story of public interest value. And um, it was important for us to know about that, but that was based on anonymity as well. And just this week, Peter Van Onselen um, on the 10 Network reporting on sexual misbehaviour in, in Parliament House, that was also based on an anonymous source. And it's had impact. I mean, it's, you know, it's arguable that the only impact it has was to get the Prime Minister to come out and talk about the issue, but it had impact. So, um, I mean, I think that there is a role for, for anonymous sources. Uh, I think that media, uh, that news organisations need to be to, to continue being very vigilant in how they use them. Um, but I also think, I, I mean, I think that that point that Anthony raised earlier about the sniff test, you know, making sure that you understand that that, that what you're reading, I mean, it's important for, for readers to know that they can trust what they're reading. They're not silly. Um, they can they can smell something that's not right. They can they can feel that. They can see it. They read it. Um, and so it is incumbent on on journalists to make sure that they don't fall down that trap. Thanks, Monica. Okay, so the pub test, the sniff test. Um, Anthony, would it be fair to say that plausibility comes into this as well? I had a just to let you know, I had um, a journalism colleague, uh, Brian Tui. I'm sure you both would know him. Um, he raised with me the issue of a story about the Chinese government um, allegedly trying to plant a spy in the Australian Parliament. Um, and Brian pointed out to me that this alleged plant um, was deep in debt, um, had serious issues, and there was no chance he would ever get through a pre-selection process, uh, let alone elected to the Australian Parliament. So he thought the story over-egged the case because it just didn't seem plausible. Is that a fair? Is that is that what you're talking about when you talk about this pub test and sniff test? I think plausibility is important. I mean, I would slightly disagree with Brian on on that point. I mean. You have a you have a lot of uh, spies in Australia. Let's call them. Um, some of them are official spies. Some of them are less official and very low grade, um, and and are trying to do very low grade things that perhaps um, they have never had any chance of uh, succeeding with, um, but they're trying nonetheless. So I, I mean, I agree. The plot that's being referred to is probably implausible, but it's not implausible that. Um, that foreign intelligence services still try those kinds of things and they do go for that kind of low hanging fruit there, um, even if it's not, uh, even if they're not gonna get the best asset out of that person, um, it is still plausible things that some very low rent intelligence op operatives are, are doing that kind of thing. But I agree on the general point that, that you know, you've got to put a rational lens on things. Okay, thanks. Um, so here's one more final question for you, Anthony, and then I think we can go to our Q&A. There'll be no doubt questions for both Monica and you, Anthony. Um, aside from an anonymous source, Anthony, another thing that I kind of know that happens, but I don't know any of the details, but you would, and I'm sure many of our audience are in the same position, is that we know uh, government agencies regularly give background briefings for journalists. So this is different from an anonymous source. But I think there are some concerns out there that worry about background briefings as well. That is, they imagine that a government bureaucrat, for example, may be trying to use information on background to get at a story that will, you know, cover their butt or, 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 or to achieve some other political objective. Um, are these background briefings, are they common occurrences and in your view, uh, you know, do they serve a useful purpose? And what is that useful purpose? Uh, departments reaching out proactively to do background briefings um, are not really common. Um, they happen occasionally. Um, I, I, don't, I personally think they don't happen enough. Um, I think uh, it's important, I think, to get out to the listeners out there how opaque the Australian bureaucracy is compared to some countries that you would think would be comparable. Um, when I go in for a briefing with any department, be it DFAT or Defence, um, there are heavy, heavy restrictions placed on what you can report. Essentially, most of the time, you can't quote from that briefing. Um, when I go in for a briefing to the um, US embassy or, or some European embassies, um, you can quote from pretty much anything they they tell you. Um, sometimes 
named or sometimes, you know, a senior official, but, you know, they're allowed, they're, they're going on the record. Uh, the Australian system is just a lot more opaque, a lot more sensitive, a lot more, uh, you know, paranoid about engaging with the media. And I, so to answer your question, there should be more background briefings and there should be um, less restrictions based on them. So Anthony, what, um, what purpose do, if, if they were more open, um, how would your journalism be better, and the public be better informed if there were more, um, you know, uh, more uh, briefings that weren't off the record, that were on the record? How, how would that help the public interest? Oh, well, to go back to, I mean, sourcing policy, I'm not allowed to say it is understood. So I have to, I mean, whatever they give me, I have to kind of, attribute it to something. So if I can actually say, you know, according to a senior official, um, be it, you know, DFAT official or defense official or home affairs official, if I can attribute that, that's, that's important to convey to the readers where I'm getting this information from, which, which um, department thinks this, um, which, is, which department is providing this information, where is, where is it coming from? I just find other Western governments are a lot more forthcoming with them um, and a lot more relaxed, uh, a lot more transparent about dealing with the media than Australia. Okay, thanks, Ethi. Again, I'd just like to invite our audience to shoot through those questions for Monica and Ed. For Monica and Anthony. Monica, is that your experience as a practitioner as well that you find the Australian system in terms of the extent to which government officials and politicians and bureaucrats are willing to go on the record? Is, is that a is, is that a recognised problem in our media landscape? Oh, it's certainly one that you hear um, Canberra-based reporters talking about a lot, like Anthony. I, I've not worked in Canberra, so it's not been my, my personal experience. Um, but um, I, I, you know, I, think it's, I think it's obvious, really, that when you speak to um, um, an Australian uh, bureaucrat or, or even politician, but bureaucrats mostly, that they are cautious, um, that there's a real mistrust of the media there, um, or, and, or, or perhaps as well as a mistrust of the media, a fear of the consequences of what might be published under their name. Um, or being recognised as being the source of that information. So I think it's there. Um, but again, because I haven't worked in Canberra and I certainly haven't worked on a round like Anthony has, which would be particularly sensitive, I imagine, um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what those briefings are like. Um, but certainly there is a, a kind of, oh, I think people have commented about it quite regularly, a kind of a degree of paranoia in Australia about, about giving information about how it's going to be used. Um, and that's, that's a great tragedy because that does impact public interest journalism. I, I think um, there needs to be a proper conversation within the Australian Public Service about what is classified information because it's misconstrued in my opinion a lot of the time. Yeah. Just because information is in a classified document doesn't make it classified information. It means some information in that document is classified. Um, so I come up across that kind of issue a lot where you just get from the government or officials, I can't talk about that. It, it's, it's classified, it's in a classified document. And it's like, well, no, it, it's um, not necessarily. We, you know, that information might, you, that information could be declassified. It doesn't mean all the information in that document is classified. So you come up at, um, with that a lot where I do think the American system is a lot better at kind of working out what they can tell the media and what they can't. Okay, thank you. Let me go to our first question. It's come through by email rather than the, the Q&A box. Um, so forgive me if I just look at my phone. Um, this is at a recent UTS ACRI discussion on China. Um, me, Professor Lawrenson, objected to the use of such phrases as linked to or has links to. I think linked to creates a suspicion 
without telling us anything informative or useful about the nature of the relationship or how close or how strong the connection might be. Um, Monica or David, uh, Anthony, sorry, David is the questioner. Monica or Anthony, do you have any comments on that? Anthony, you mentioned before you've got a real problem with the statement, it is understood. Um, what about so-and-so is linked to? Any concerns around that statement? I believe I've used that terminology before, so I will go away and, and think, you, think about it uh, hard, James. Um, I see where that question is coming from. It's, in, it's an easy term to use. I mean, journalism is all about using as few words as possible to convey as much information. Um, link to is, is two words. Um, you can convey that information quite quickly to the reader, but whether it's um, conveying other things that, that are unfair or cast unfair dis dispersions on that, that person is, is probably a good question. Okay. Monica, any comments from you on um, linked no, to? I, I'd only to say that, um, you know, perhaps the use of the term linked to is, uh, it, it falls within that amp that I was talking about earlier of, of editors pushing journalists to provide some um, contextual background to a source. Um, without without identifying them clearly and without identifying the group to which they necessarily belong to, so linked to is a, is a kind of softer way of doing that. Um, but it's you know it's clumsy and ugly and um, it'd be better if we didn't have to do it. And, and Anthony, just to let you know, even if you have used linked to two, I certainly don't hold it against you. Um, although I do understand the point of the question because that term does come up often, certainly not just from you, from, it routinely comes up. And I know there's plenty of people in the Australia China space who always wonder what precisely it actually means. Okay, let's go to the next question. This is from um, Louise Edwards, who is a professor at the University of New South Wales. And I'm very proud to say she's also an adjunct professor at UTS ACRI. She asks, what is the impact on social of social, what is the impact of social media commentary and non-professional journalism on national security and international relations reporting? Does it make your job in writing serious reporting more difficult? Anthony, I think I might go to you for that one. I, I guess the question is, you know, do, 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 are you under any pressure to sensationalise or, um, you know, put a bit of spice to your stories, given that that's what's often done in these uh, social media outlets that are really designed to grab eyeballs um, rather than, you know, a, a serious treatment of facts and evidence? Yeah, I mean, I think Twitter especially is, is proved hugely problematic. For, for journalism in general, whether it's national security reporting, whether it's political reporting. Um, I, I think um, both with the commentary on the journalism and then and then journalists always feeling a need to provide a, a hot take, um, let us say, uh, for, for things that they're reporting on instead of kind of calmly putting down what they know in, a, in their story, that, you know, that they are, um, just feel so much need to get it out on Twitter, for example. So I think especially that medium has proved um, really problematic for journalism. Um, there are so many benefits as well uh, of, of a medium like Twitter, but um, it, it does um, put journalists under the microscope a bit more. Um, and I think too many journalists are, are putting their cards on the table in terms of what they think about an issue personally. Um, so I, I, I personally long for the days when uh, a journalist could just put up their story um, that they've thought long and hard about, whether it's an analysis piece or whether it's a hard news piece of journalism and, and just let that speak for itself. Yeah, and to be sure, we do see examples of that. I mean, I think in particular of pieces I've read from um, your colleague, Eric Bagshaw, and also Will Glasgow from The, um, the Australian and, and Mike Smith from the AFR, where you read a piece and it's just laying out the facts. And I always delight <laughs> in reading those pieces, even if they're perhaps not as um, spicy as some of the other versions. Monica, on that question, as you have young journalists coming through the journalism school, do you think they feel that 
pressure from social media more so than people like Anthony who've been in the field for, for a few years? No, I don't think so. Um, I think, uh, so uh, what, what we tend to do, particularly with the undergraduates, is that we encourage them to use Twitter more as a kind of platform of, uh, to curate news and information, um, because that, that, that helps them to be more widely read, and that's, that's been um, quite good. We also encourage them to follow people who um, and organisations who they like and agree with and those that they don't, so that they're not isolated in a bubble. Um, we warn them about the perils of Twitter and they are, as Anthony has outlined, and they're really, really obvious. Uh, it, it, it does often surprise me to see um, well-established, experienced journalists laying their cards on the table, uh, particularly in political terms, and I often find that distressing. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm old school, and so I, it was around long before social media as a practising journalist, and I find that whole idea of um, everybody knowing your political inclination a very uncomfortable one. Um, I cringe at it, actually, um, but you see it all the time. And, um, but, and, and I think what we try to emphasise to our students is don't let that happen. Just don't let that happen. Um, whoever reads you, watches you, listens to you, wants to know that you're coming from nowhere, you know, um, as much criticism as there is around that. And I think one of the other big dangers is that social media has kind of allowed advocacy journalism to come into the, into the picture. And I personally find advocacy journalism hugely problematic. Um, but I think it is a direct result of social media. Mm, thanks, Monica. That um, advocacy journalism, I guess that's a topic for a whole nother event. I might let the UTS Journalism School run that particular event. And on Twitter, Anthony, um, I can assure you it's not just journalists who find that medium troubling. Um, it's not a lot of fun, <laughs> often for yeah. academics as well. I mean, one thing I was going to say is, you know, on Twitter, I've been accused of being you know, a China hawk and a, and a China dove, um, depending on the person who's criticising you. Your journalism um so it goes to that point of don't don't fall into that don't read it really uh, i mean read the sensible stuff if, if you're if you're uh, replying to me james i'll, I'll uh, engage with you um but you know the trolls don't engage because you're just going to fall into a trap of um of lowering yourself down to their level and you might um, then maybe take their criticism on board in your next piece of journalism when, when the criticism wasn't warranted in the first place. Yeah. yeah. I think that can happen. And that's something that we warn against as well. Yeah. And, and the other point there, of course, Anthony, is that the trolls actually generally don't even read the piece. I mean, they're just <laughs> the headline and they go bang. Okay, let me uh, finish up with this question um, to either of you, and I, we are running out of time, so I'd be grateful if you'd keep um, responses brief. It's from Jacinta Keast, who I know, she is a fabulous young Australian-China scholar, um, lots of experience on the ground in China, great language skills as well, and she asks this, um, how has the recent defamation case between Chow Chuck Wing and the ABC affected national security reporting and reporting on China, if at all? It's a big question. I am sorry we are running out of time, but would any of you like to offer any quick uh, thoughts on that question? Does, does oh, defamation, is that something you're worried about? Yeah, I would be. I'll, I'll pass that to Anthony. Oh, I mean, it, it, without, I don't think I could point to any kind of concrete um, examples of how it's affected my journalism, for example, but any big case like that where the claimant is successful in a defamation action just makes every media organisation's lawyers that extra bit cautious about pursuing anything else in that kind of realm. Um, uh, I think Australia's, Australia's defamation laws uh, need an absolute do-over. They're not, um, they're, they're absolutely uh, um, in the favour of the powerful, the rich and powerful, um, and they're, they're, they're weighted against good public interest journalism. Right, thanks, Anthony. So there's another um, event, perhaps, Monica, that UTS Journalism 
get a whole host in the future around um, around journalism and public interest and defamation issues. Look, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, I see there's a few more questions. I, I would love to keep asking them, but I do uh, put a, a, a an emphasis on finishing promptly. So look, I think we might uh, finish up there. I personally just want to thank um, First Monica Attard from UTS Journalism and Anthony Galloway from the Sydney Morning Herald for participating in this webinar today. It's been an important topic and I think we've been successful in exploding a few of the myths um, and letting people without that media and journalism background give them some, some real insight into the issues that you two um, face every day. I'm just going to pass now to my colleague, um, Thomas, to wrap things up today. Thanks, James. And thank you, Monica and Anthony as well. Members of the audience will be sending an email to everyone here asking for your thoughts on how this webinar went. If you could please fill out that feedback form, we'd really appreciate it. And we can make sure that future UTS ACRI events are a better experience for everyone. If you wanted to know more about the Australia-China relationship and about our research, more details are available on our website at australiachinarelations.org. The discussion today is also available there. Please follow us on Twitter for the latest news at ACRI underscore UTS. Thanks again to our speakers, James Lawrenson, Monica Attard, and Anthony Galloway. And thank you to all of our attendees. See you next time.